This episode of the Dorking Out Show podcast is brought to you by the Thomas and Martha Wayne Foundation, providing low-cost and free health care for the neediest of Gotham City since 1979. And the letter P, because you can't spell premature without P. And uh, don't don't worry about it, GOP. It's normal. No, really, it's fine. It it happens all the time. Let's let's just cuddle. Houston flight is go. Myla, all let's go. SPM. From Assignment X, Amalgamated Storytelling, and the SoniaShow.com, it's Dorking Out with Sonia Mansfield and Christopher Allen Smith. Welcome to episode 15 of Dorking Out, a podcast for people who like to dork out about stories and the stories and culture that we love. That means movies and TV, books and podcasts, and pretty much everywhere and everything else you, where you find stories that interest you or us or stumbling over words. <laughs> With me today is my co-host. We're not doing that again. We're, we're charging ahead. With me today is my co-host professional writer and author of The Sonia Show, Sonia Mansfield. Hey there. Hello. With me today is my co-host, Emmy Award-winning filmmaker and nerd author, Christopher Allen Smith. Now, before we start the show, before we tell you all the secret cool things that we have in today's episode, we need to address the elephant in the room. Sonia. Yes. This was, was my... <laughs> I'm that sorry. Was that was an awful, awful joke where I tried to imply that you were an elephant. Thank you for. I'm sorry. That was. I uh, all right. You know what? No, I'm gonna have to own it. Sony Mansfield. Yes. You were. I'm not. I'm not an elephant. You were not an elephant. You were sick for the last couple of days. I was sick. I want to apologize to our listeners for the delay of our episode. Normally, we will always be out on Monday nights. I was very sick. So Smith was kind enough to delay one day. So I apologize for the delay and hopefully it'll never happen again. No, but here's what's awful. You're letting me off too easy. So on Sunday was your birthday. Happy birthday. Say Thank everybody. You. Say happy birthday to Sonia. Thank you, everybody. Happy birthday, Sonia. She has a, I love this story. Tell the story of your little son. We had a birthday party for him on Saturday, and one of the little kids at the party got sick. That's right. And then... And what happened? Actually, what happened? This this is actually so, going to connect up to something we talk about later. He he threw up a couple of times. That's right. Poor little boy. He's, he's only two. He threw up a couple of times. Uh, I went out on Sunday for my birthday. Everything's fine. But I woke up Monday morning very sick, and I was throwing up. Then I found out that both of his parents got sick and another guest from the party also got sick. So that little boy turned out to be a bit of an outbreak monkey. I love and, that. Right now, and, as we speak, sickness is radiating out from the Bay every, Area. Yeah. So a couple of people got sick from the party. It's pretty sad. <laughs> it's sad. So Sonia texted me yesterday, apologetic. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sick. I can't do it. She just did it again right now. Oh, I'm sorry, Chris. Can we delay? Yeah, no problem. Of course. So we finally get on the show to talk about what happened and to bring you our show that we're so excited. And what do I do? You call me an elephant. I make some half-assed dumb joke about you being an elephant because I'm awful. You are awful. But that's not news. So let's get to the news. On this week's episode, we talk about the season premiere of Saturday Night Live and wonder if this st style of sketch comedy still has a place in the 2016 world of comedy. The answer will probably not surprise you. Then we take a deep dive into HBO's new drama Westworld. Is it HBO's next Game of Thrones or is it their next final? And then we do a little status check on the fall TV season, giving updates on what we're watching and what shows we are already dumping. My list is growing fast. All that and our favorite headlines coming up. Want more Dorking Out with Chris and Sonia? Well, 
there are a few simple things you can do. Share this program with a friend. We're assuming you have friends. It's easy. Just go to dorkingoutshow.com and you'll find our podcast links, our SoundCloud account, our YouTube links, our Facebook links, our Twitter links, our Tumblr links, and all our other links. And links. Grab one of those links and get to sharing. The more people listen, the more we make. Make all your friends envious with the cool podcasting choices you've made as a modern trendsetter. Our audience research shows the Dorking Out Show podcast audience is the smartest, most attractive, least prone to baseless flattery in the entire podcasting world. So get those links and get the sharing. Now, on with the show. That brings us to topic one, the season 42 premiere of Saturday Night Live Deep in the heart of this crazy political season, Sonia Mansfield, what the Saturday yeah. Night Live, you know, we're coming here where there's a million sketch shows now. We've talked about the prol- proliferation of dramas and what that means for people who like to watch dramas on TV. But since Saturday Night Live first started in the early 70s, and I'm sorry to say that I've seen a live episode with every single cast. <laughs> What? You should be sorry. That's a humble brag. It is a little bit of a humble brag, but then it's like, man, that that was one nerdy kid. <laughs> but anyway, what is Saturday Night Live? You know, in the era of uh, Key and Peel, in the era of Dave Chappelle, even though it's ten years past, in the era of uh, Amy Schumer. What do you what do you think of Saturday Night Live? What does it mean to you? Well, I I think that's the thing. SNL used to be like the must see show for topical comedy but now with so many options i find that it's it's just not as must see for me as it used to be Mm -hmm. and i i don't it's really strange too because in past seasons like presidential races that's really when snl it was like their time to shine right like they they were so good with like will ferrell's george w bush or dana carvey's george h bush you know hartman's uh, Bill Clinton, uh, you know, uh, Tina Fey, Sarah Palin and Chevy Chase's Gerald Ford. Like it was just so funny. And I don't know if it was just because they didn't have like someone really great doing Trump and Clinton that it's just not working for me. Really? And although I thought Alec Baldwin's Trump was pretty good. Uh huh. And, but I don't know if I really like, um, Kate McKinnon, uh-huh. but her 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 Clinton's a little like the one I saw this Saturday was like she was like Bugs Bunny. Yeah, it was a little weird. Yeah, you it know, didn't seem like she. It doesn't seem like she's really nailed Clinton. Like she doesn't really look like her. She doesn't really act like her either. Oh, I think you're crazy. I Just, think. You, oh, keep going. Sorry. That's fine. I thought I, I, thought I would pull she, it I don't think she you. really acts like it. Like, I think every once in a while she does like a little something that you're like, well, yeah, that's Clinton. But like, she doesn't re- like, I don't think she's nailed her the way like Tina Fey did Sarah Palin. Right. Well, yeah. I mean, Tina Fey doing Sarah Palin is one for the record books. Right. Um, but I thought this, I, I was shocked at how good the season premiere was. And I and I th- actually think Kate McKinnon, she's it's almost a little bit like Chevy Chase's. I was just gonna say maybe. Gerald Ford, yeah. where Chevy. The thing that was great about Ch- Chevy <laughs> Chase's like Gerald Ford all. is he made no effort to look like him, <laughs> none. But he kind of acted like him, or he acted like the public persona of Gerald right. Ford at the time, which was stumbling around and tripping and whatever. Um, and he was, you know, Chevy Chase became a legend doing Gerald Ford stumbling around uh, every time. And it was great. And I think Kate McKinnon's, I think Kate McKinnon's Hillary is a little different because usually, you know, like like with the famous uh, uh, Michael Dukakis, John Lovett's playing Michael Dukakis. Which, by the sketch. way, I was totally expecting them to just have right. Hillary Clinton say, like, I can't believe I'm losing to this guy. Well, that's the thing, <laughs> is they usually kind of beat up on the 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 uh, Republicans like they did in that. And like, you know, like uh, John Lovett says that, but, you know, 
Bush went on to win that thing. And, right. Um, but with Kate McKinnon, she gets the essence of what I think people think about, what a lot of people think about. Even, even uh, Clinton supporters is that she's really ambitious. She's studied for a long time. This is something she's wanted. And she almost... You know, in in the way that she's run several times, in the way that she talks about the presidency, you could tell she's just she wants it so bad, and the way that McKinnon plays with that idea of ambition and studying hard and being a Type A personality, driving at something, is just really funny. But they don't they don't just start bashing her. You know, you can almost tell when Saturday Night Live writers or the cast doesn't really like somebody. Right. They'll just really start ripping into them. And I think that's kind of what happened with Sarah Palin is let's make this person a joke, which, you know, how can you blame them? Because what they were dealing with was Sarah Palin and, you know, she was not a serious person. It just writes itself. Exactly. It was a situation (laughs) where it just wrote itself and they just, Tina Fey had to kind of do a little bit of an accent and... And I think, wasn't there one sketch, I'm pretty sure there was one sketch where every line that came out of Tina Fey's mouth was something Sarah Palin had actually said. That would not surprise me. I can't remember the name or which skit that was. But anyway, I I really loved it. I think that's really interesting that it works for you and it just doesn't work for me. I did really like it, uh, Amy Poehler's Clinton. Yeah. So maybe there's just a taste difference there. I think it might be. Well, I'm I'm wondering if the thing, and I think that might be the thing, is Amy Poehler's Clinton was kind of like, oh, I'm flighty, I'm this, I'm that. I'm kind of overly excitable, but there's kind of none of the, there was no edge to it, you know, and that's how, you know, you, you saw uh, Hillary Clinton and uh, Amy Poehler actually in a skit together, and I know that they've done the same thing with uh, Kate McKinnon and Hillary Clinton, um, but I just I just thought that they're they're pl- doing several different jokes at the same time with Kate McKinnon's uh, Hillary. I think it's for me it's one of the best impressions that they've done for a long time. But um, that is so funny that you think that, and I was like, eh. Yeah. And I really like Kate McKinnon too, by the yeah. way. I don't want to make it sound like I yeah. don't like her. I yeah. super love her. Well, yeah, yeah, you know that I guess that's the thing is she doesn't But the truth is like I don't watch SNL all the time. Like it, like I said, I used to be something I watched all the time and now I don't watch it that often. I tend to wait until like an article comes out the next day that says here's the fourth be- the fourth uh, the four best skits of the show. Right. And you I th- know, something it- uh, yeah, and I think a lot of people, that's how they watch it now. I, I'm kind of, I tape it and I watch it with my son, Dell, who, you know, he wants to be a comedian and he set his sights on being on Saturday Night Live. And, you know, five years ago, ten years ago, it's like, well, Saturday Night Live can't really go on forever and it seems like it's not that good anymore. Um, but after reading Tom Shale's SNL book and kind of rereading the uh, expanded edition. Um, Are you talking about Live from New York? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. yeah, it's Saturday Night Live's a strange cat in that it's the only thing that's live on television anymore, except for sports. No other television I, shows. That's true. You're are right. Live. And because of that, things get on the air that in any other show would have been cut. You know, so that's how bad sketches get on. And people have this impression of, oh, uh, you know, Saturday Night Live's not good and the sketches suck a lot and whatever. But that's the way it is with all sketch yeah. shows. It's just with other sketch shows, they cut the ones that suck because they're recorded. Yeah. And then when they're ready, they put out an episode. The fault of my plan of I just read an article the next day that tells me which sketches to watch is I miss something that maybe they all think is lame mm-hmm. that it turns out I super love. So... For example, yeah. a couple of weeks ago, my husband said, have you ever seen the skit with Bill Hader as Vincent Price? And oh, he hosts, yes. Like Halloween shows. Yes. <laughs> and I was like, no, I've never seen that. And he's like, how could you have not seen that? And he showed them to me and they are so funny. Yeah. I had never seen, I never even heard of them. 
Yeah. No, they're great. The thing that's great about that is I, I listened to Bill Hader on one of these podcasts. I can't remember. And he t- told the story of trying to get trying to get those sketches past Lauren Michaels. And it was basically, you know, oh, I'd like to do this and be really funny. And we'd have like Jackie Mason come in. And, and or, he was, I'm sure the audience are like, they don't know who any of these people are. Exactly. That's the thing. <laughs> and Lauren Michaels goes, well, that's a great idea. But why now? And it's like, there's nothing topical about this. There's nothing in the moment. There's These shouldn't work in any way. But I think he did like three or four of them. He did. Just... My husband showed them all to me. They're really funny. Yeah, it's just, <laughs> it was really funny. But um, but yeah, I think, and that's the other thing about Saturday Night Live where people say, oh, it sucks and this and that, is that if you go back and just take the best episode, the best sketches of a season... You can make that season look like, oh my God, this is amazing. Right. This is, this, th- we are in a golden age of Saturday Night Live. How, how have I missed this? But in fact, it's just they're plucking a couple things, which is really instructive because if you go back, they're starting to put out, or they've been putting out the full seasons of the, uh, the first few years. Mm-hmm. So you'll be able to watch an entire episode rather than a condensed down clip show. Right. And there's a lot of bad stuff. You know, you see John Belushi, Dan Aykroyd, Jane Curtin, Bill Murray. They're just in a lot of bad, you know, those those past 1230 sketches are just like, wow, they sucked back then. Yeah, they're not they're <laughs> not all, you know, land shark and. Exactly. Exactly. Fasomatic. So um, so who is I want to I want to try something out here. OK. Who's your favorite cast? Well, my favorite is Phil Hartman. So, I you know what, though? And probably around the time when Phil Hartman was on and Farley was on, mm-hmm. it's probably my favorite. So, I, I was in college. Uh-huh. It's probably my favorite. So, that was probably what? Phil Hartman, Jan Hooks, yeah. Farley. Yeah, Farley. Mike Myers. Mike, yeah. Yeah. Like that sort of thing. Um, I, so. I don't remember the exact lineup there. Yeah. No, I think you didn't. Maybe Adam close. Sandler was like a guest star then. Yeah. A regular. Um, but those were like my college Interesting. years. Interesting. All right. What about you? Well, that's the thing is I, I fall into this Saturday Night Live stereotype. And Lauren Michael says that he's, you can pick out when people go to when people were in high school by what cast is their favorite. Um, and he usually can figure out exactly whose cast is their favorite just by asking. And my, and that's completely true. Mine is 86 to 90. It was Phil Hartman, Dana Carvey, John Lovitz, Nora Dunn, Jan Hooks, uh, Kevin Nealon, uh, Dennis Miller, Dennis Miller. Yeah. I mean, that is well, just, that, that one's really awesome too. Yeah, you know, and it and it kills me, you know, that Phil Hartman is not around anymore because you see, oh um, god, he was so funny. Yeah, you see Daryl Hammond doing. I I I've had this impression this last, you know, because this last weekend when they had um, Daryl Hammond playing Bill Clinton on a sketch, and seeing oh, you know, Lorne Michaels is bringing in Alec Baldwin to be Trump. He's bringing in Daryl Hammond, who was playing Bill Clinton 15 years ago. And you're thinking, wow, if Phil Hartman was still alive, he would be in this skit right now. Right. He would. They would have pulled out, you know, season premiere. They would have put all, pulled out all the stops. But uh, it's just, yeah. So is Saturday Night Live, from your point of view, is that still something that you think is valuable? or? Uh... I do think, I think it is. I think for the exact reason you said it. It is one of the only things that is live, mm-hmm. and that makes it more interesting mm-hmm. to me. But the truth is, I still don't watch it every week. Right, right. Now, how do you? Because I, when I was watching the, they, you know, opened this last episode with a skit, you know, a debate skit between Donald Trump and uh, yeah Hillary Clinton. What for me? As soon as that started, even though they'd been promoting it for a week, I was thinking. It, I almost kind of got that feeling that I used to get when watching The Daily Show, which is, oh, 
the show that I is firing on all cylinders, the show that I really like is now about to take on the subject I like or this big subject and I've been waiting all week to see what they're going to do. Do you have that did you have that feeling or is that kind of now for you like Samantha B's show or John Oliver or I'm more interested in seeing like Samantha B's to right. be honest. Right. Interesting. I was I was curious to see Alec Baldwin's impression. So I did watch it. Mhm. Uh I don't think it I don't know if it would be enough to bring me back though. Yeah. Yeah. You know. So you don't you won't even do you ever do you think about putting it on your uh DVR? And just... I don't even I don't own a DVR. What? Dun dun dun. How do you I thought you first of all, how do you watch television in the modern era without a DVR? I have on demand. My God. My God, Sonia Mansfield, you used to be the television queen of everything. I used to have a DVR. I recently got rid of it. Why did you do that? Because the only thing I was recording was Turner Classic Movies. <laughs> <sighs> it's true. The you only know, thing I was recording, it was full of old movies. I wonder if you could tell someone's age. I, well, definitely you could tell someone's age by what they have on their DVR. Actually, we should we should. Well, then I'm like a sixty-something-year-old woman, That's apparently, because right. I love me some Turner Classic movies. I was gonna say we should we should have a we should have a segment where we compare what we have on our respective DVRs. But you don't even have one, so just forget it. You could buy me a TiVo. It was my birthday. That's true, but I won't. <laughs> See the thing about do that for, is do it for the show, Smith. The thing about that is no. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So with all of that being said, I think it's time that we bring in Ben Waddell. Let's bring in an expert. Let's bring in an expert, Ben Waddell, our resident improv correspondent, and let's have a listen to what he has to say while I interrupt him. So to fill us in on all the Saturday Night Live news, backstage shenanigans, and giving us a little bit of a heads up of what last this weekend's episode was like from an actual improvisational comedian point of view, we're bringing back friend of the show, Ben Waddell. Mm. What did you think of the season 42 premiere of Saturday Night Live with Margot Robbie? Give me your thoughts. Well, first off, thanks for having me back, Chris. Um, I loved last night's premiere. Uh, I, I wasn't quite sure about Margot Robbie. I was pretty sure she was going to do a good job. Uh, and then the other things that I was wondering about were the the most recent announcement that Alec Baldwin has now been signed for the whole year to play Trump on the show. Uh, and then also the addition of three new cast members, Mikey Day, Alex Moffat, and uh, Melissa Vill Villasenor. Um, I was a little bummed actually to find out that Chris Red wasn't going to be in the cast. He was announced and then it didn't happen. But uh, yeah, so basically, though, barring all that out, this is one of the best shows they've done in years. Uh, I, I actually I rewatched the show this morning and I was looking at the list of the sketches and trying to figure out which sketches were hits and which ones were misses, because usually it's about half and half. Yeah. Uh, in, in any episode, there's going to be three or four hits and about three or four misses. Because uh, there's usually about seven to eight sketches at night. Um, but in this one, I was looking at the the kind of the rundown. They had the debate in the cold open. Huge hit. Great stuff. Alec Baldwin's Trump impression, which I was amazed that they would even get him because Taron Killam could do a Trump impression, but they dropped him. Uh, Daryl Hammond does a, does a legendary Trump impression, and they didn't use him, even I though they did use him for Bill Clinton later on the night. Well, that's the thing is I think they're I think they're going to need to keep their powder dry with him as Bill Clinton. Possibly, yeah. Well, and then he also is doing all the announcing for the show too. Um, so, uh, as but and then Baldwin's version of Trump is mo a bigger and kind of more vile caricature than anybody has done in the past. Um, everybody else seemed to kind of be trying to nail the actual guy and like make him make yourself sound as much like him as possible. Baldwin is doing a straight up almost like assassination hack job of the man uh, to make him look as bad as possible. And it works and it's really funny. So yeah, the, the cold open was amazing. The, the debate sketch between Trump and Hillary, 
both sides nailed it perfectly. Um, it's this felt like the first time they really went after Trump to make him look as bad as he is. Uh, and then right from there, we go into the fact check monologue with Mar- Margot Robbie. That's a big hit. That's really funny. Uh, and I feel like they haven't done that format of a no- of a monologue before. Yeah. Uh, and that's but- monologues are usually, they try stuff like that. And I don't know, maybe I'm being mean, but it seems like 40% of the time it works. And the other 60%, is either a comedian doing some of their bits or it just doesn't work. They just slide off and it's awkward and awful. But yeah, that, that opening monologue was pretty funny. Yeah, very funny. Well, and, it, and now I think it gives them another game. Yeah. Um, because really, and I've heard, I was listening to some interviews with Seth Meyers over the, uh, over the summer, and he talked about how, you know, anytime you're seeing them up there doing a bit that they've done multiple times before, there is a reason, and the reason is that host can't do a monologue. Um, so that's, that's why you'll see them singing a song, doing a question and answer bit, um, you know, having a lot of other cast members up there to like walk them through stuff that all is there to fix the problem of this, this person can't stand, stand up there and tell jokes for five minutes. Um, so yeah, so, so that, but that monologue was great. The first sketch, uh, the sinkhole girlfriend sketch oh my was, God. That was so fantastic. funny. Yeah. Yeah. So funny. Done so well. And it seems like something that I feel like they've done before, but never this well. Right. Um, Where there was, I mean, every time that I thought, okay, it must be done by now. We've done enough jokes about how this schlub shouldn't be with this girl and they'd find another layer. Yeah. And it was just great the whole way through. Interesting thing too, about that very first sketch, uh, both of the new guys right off the bat were right in there. Mikey day ends up being, kind of the main straight man to the whole bit as the schl- schlubby guy. Yeah. So, yeah. It's, you know, it's, so you can see right away they're using him. They're throwing him right in the deep end. It's funny because I, when I, I found myself watching that sketch as it went on, and that's the thing about a lot of Saturday Night Live sketches is they go on and on and they stop getting – it's like, yeah, we get the joke. We've heard the joke five times, but mm-hmm. then they carry it on for another, you know, 60% of the sketch is funny. 40% is, all right. We've already seen it. That's enough. But they just yeah. kept hitting it and they kept bringing in other correspondents and stuff and experts from Caltech and whatever. And it just kept building and, and it was funny. And it got to the point where I'm thinking, I hope they kind of do this with a lot of things. Having an entire news team try to cover a relationship <laughs> as though it's a news story is, I mean, that's yeah. something that The Onion has done in a newspaper type format for, you know, almost two decades now, but watching it, watching a news team do it live on the air, it was just really funny. Yeah. And yeah, I, it was I, great. I hope it's one of those Saturday Night Live sketches that they go back to over and over and over with different kinds of uh, relationships and stuff. And it was just, it was great. It was really good. And yeah, I'd love to see him give it another try at it. Uh, I, I'd probably, I mean, I'd be, I probably think the best you could do would be maybe two, one or two more of these. Uh, before the whole thing w- works itself out, but yeah, it's uh, this was a great bit. And having you're right, having the entire news crew, having Leslie, jo- especially Leslie Jones, coming in, uh, which interesting <laughs> thing when she got up during the monologue, mm-hmm. huge pop from the crowd. Yeah, uh, it's, it's interesting to see how she went from like not even really on the cast. They just let her do that one weekend update bit, and in only a year and a half, she's now one of the biggest stars on the show. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think yeah. she's getting a lot of. You know, this was a rough, <laughs> this was a rough summer for Saturday Night Live and a lot of the yeah. cast members, and she had a really rough go from let's let's just face it, just flat out the worst, most vile parts of the internet just decided to make tormenting Leslie Jones their summer project, and yeah. it's you know it's and it look, was we get a sketch of it about it at the end of the show, <laughs> so oh no. Here's yeah. here's why I have to admit I did the thing that I usually do with Saturday Night Live. You and stopped actually, watching after Weekend Update. I stopped watching a sketch or two after Weekend Update, which I know oh. I'm not supposed to do. And if I had done, if I had been doing this back when Wayne's World first premiered, I would have missed the first Wayne World also. Wayne's World also. But now, here's, here's where you lucked yeah. out though, because the last sketch of the night was also the only bad sketch of the night. Oh, no kidding. Well, I got it on my TiVo. I'll check it out. Yeah. So, so, it's, um, so yeah. So going down again, going down the list. So we talked about single girlfriend was good. That was the first real sketch. Right after that, we had the digital short about the nasty librarian. 
which initially I was worried because it was like, oh, it's going to be all about Margot Robbie being pretty all night long. Right. Nope. They fixed that. Uh, then we had Political Family Feud, another great example of people doing great impressions. We got to see uh, Via Senor in her first sketch doing uh, Sarah Silverman's impression. Right. Um, that was good. And then Weekend Update, which this this was finally the Weekend Update where they gelled, where Che and Jost actually – felt like a real team like they really felt comfortable with each other um you think so i thought they I, so. I thought they were the way that they kind of busted each other's balls last year i thought they i liked their rapport a lot last year i liked it too but it never it didn't totally feel like it was in sync whereas this year probably because they're starting from the beginning of the year already with that camaraderie and that bond right it's it feels like it's gotten to an even another level of, you know, dare I say, I, I won't say Faye and Polar because Faye and Polar to me were the, the two biggest, like they synced more than anybody else ever has. But like Faye and Fallon the first couple of years. Right. Um, right. Where they, they gelled, but not as not great gel, but good gel. And that's where Jost and Shay feel like they are now right now. So that was that was a great weekend update. So let, let me let me, you know, before we got on on the mic, we were talking about various things over the summer. So. Two things – there were kind of two semi-shocking announcements as the summer went by. And usually that – you know, somewhere between July 15th and August 15th, cast members get fired. If they are not either fired during the season, that's when, you know, cast members usually find out they're not coming back. But this year, Jay Farrow and Taryn Killam both did not come back, and I was – I – it seemed to me like those guys could have been staying there and it seemed like they should have been staying there for at least a couple more seasons. I mean, those guys were really good and, you know, Taryn seemed like the kind of guy who could be there until he wanted to leave. And maybe that's what happened, but it sounded like, yep. and I believe I've read a couple interviews to this effect that he was not ready to go. Oh, but, they were both blindsided. Yeah, yeah. They both had no idea, no idea it was coming. Um, and it, it, from what I hear between the fact that, they both have movie projects that are coming up here pretty soon. Killam did a movie called uh, Brother Nature um, with Bobby Moynihan and uh, Rob Riggle and a couple other great people that's coming out here in a few months. Uh, he's He was going to take some time off the show to work on that. Um, and then uh, Jay Farrell also was going to take some time off to work on a movie. And then they both – I'm, I'm pretty sure Lauren had kind of heard the whispers that both of them had TV show offerings coming their way. Uh, and we've we've seen it since then. They were cut about a month ago, and just this last week, both of them have now have shows on Showtime. Well, at least they landed softly somewhere. But I, I'm. Lawrence but definitely, was, definitely with Pharaoh, though I agree. Pharaoh was so multifaceted in terms of what he could do with impressions. Although the show never really felt like it knew how to use him outside of Obama. Yeah. It they never like like his he did the Denzel impression once, maybe twice. He did Will Smith once, maybe. I mean, it's uh, these amazing impressions, and he would always have to like package them for a weekend update bit, right? Uh, like he did last year, where he did the rapper convention, and then the very next week he did the comedians convention, right? Um, which are both wonderful and amazing, and you know these these like impresario displays of impressionism. Um, but yeah, no, it's it, he. They needed to find more stuff for Pharaoh to do, and it felt like they just didn't know how to do that, right? So what did you think of uh, – let's wrap it up with what did you think of Margot Robbie's performance on the show? I thought she was great. Um, in fact, it's some of the best ones – and I'll, I'll mention this just because there was two more sketches that I thought were great uh, at the very end that you might have missed. Hunch Bunch, which I'm guessing you probably saw. That was Actually, no. Sco Scooby-Doo. Yeah, I, uh, I saw Hunch Bunch and I saw the women's film oh, roundtable. Which... Then you saw all the good ones because there was only – the last one was a Mr. Robot spoof. Uh, where Mr. Robot now has to hack in and find out who took Leslie Jones's pictures. Oh, okay. Uh, and that was that was not that great. That was just kind of eh. Uh, but Hunch Bunch and Women's Roundtable. Women's Roundtable felt exactly like the sketch they they've done in the last two years, where it was an alien abduction. Yeah. And Kate McKinnon just runs away with it and makes everybody else crack. Yeah. And she almost made Margot Robbie crack. I think she uh, could. I no, I would. I wouldn't say almost. She yeah. she made her crack and. This is why I think Margot Robbie, for me, kind of goes up several notches. She was able to pull it back together. 
She was she cracked, but she was a pro. I mean, she was she she really committed to a lot of these things, and you can often tell, yeah. you know, who the real actors are and who the kind of poser actors are by who mm-hmm. really full on commits to their parts and who just kind of goes through the motions. And she committed; she was there a hundred percent, and but and she was able to pull it back together in that sketch, you know, uh, playing Kate, Kira Knightley. Yeah, yeah, p- playing Kira Knightley. Uh, Kate McKinnon plays this old uh, Hollywood actress with a bunch of horrible stories and uh, Margot Robbie broke, but brought it back together and it was just unbelievably funny. No. Yeah. And, but I think the best stuff she did of the night was in hunch bunch uh, where she's, she's the girlfriend who shows up with the Scooby-Doo team. Right. uh, Although they can't call it that and doesn't, and, but it's, it's, it's using this wonderfully normal thing of, that first time your girlfriend hangs out with your friends and how awkward that is. Right. Uh, and then putting it in the Scooby-Doo world. Um, and, and I can speak to this. I've had that situation uh, where like my friends, my friends, you know, they're a bunch of guys. So we'll all kind of rib on each other and make fun of each other. And then my wife showed up back when we were dating and just went way over the top of the first one. And everyone was like, oh, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, but that's, but then that's how she and I used to rib each other is, you know, we go hard like that and like, and just, viciously jab at each other. Uh, and me and my friends didn't do that. It was a more playful environment and that having that fun dynamic, she nailed that perfectly. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's all the way through that whole sketch. She was great. So, so, all yeah. right. So this last year, you know, a couple of weeks ago, Kate McKinnon got an Emmy for her, um, work the on first, Saturday Night Live. The first performer ever to win an Emmy. Is that right? Yep. My God. They've been nominated before, but no one has ever won an Emmy for performing on SNL. She's no the very first kidding. one. All right. Well, then here's my question was going to be, you know, is she one of the greats of the female comedians on Saturday Night Live or is she the greatest? And it, well, at least from and one see, standpoint, she is the greatest. Yeah. I mean, yeah, like like numerically, I guess you'd have to say that she's the greatest because because like Kristen Wiig got nominated um, Amy Poehler, I think, got nominated. Tina Fey might have gotten nominated, but none of them won. Uh, and then going back to the old days, a lot of the ladies really haven't been respected very much on the show, uh, even though ladies like Sherry O'Terry, Molly Shannon, uh, even going back to Jan Hoek and even back further to Gilda Ratner. I'm sorry. I think you meant Jan Hooks. Is that correct? I, the way that it was always pronounced on the show was Jan Hoek. Hoek? Yeah. I don't think so. Unless we're thinking of two different people. No, we're thinking of the same lady. It's it's spelled Jan Hook. Um, but I, I don't know. That was how they always pronounced it when they would do That's how Don Pardo would say it. I don't think so. But let's All not right. relitigate anyway, something that happened yeah. 25 years ago. There and you go. May she rest um, but, in peace. No, yeah, they were. Oh, I, absolutely. They were all great, but none of them ever won an award. But I think a lot of that has more to do with how we see. Like I had this conversation earlier tonight was. So she's the only one to win an award. But is she like the best person ever to be on the show? And no, <laughs> like, like there's people who have been better than her that didn't get recognized. That's um, true. But, but in terms of in terms of ladies on the show, she definitely is. She's one of the greats. I mean, yeah. she when Kristen Wiig left, it looked like Cecily Strong was going to jump into this spot, but it ended up being Kate McKinnon. Yeah, and Cecily um, Strong, and I think I over. really like. But Kate McKinnon I really like her too. is just on another level. Yeah, she. I, for for my money, the funniest skit of the two thousands is her alien abduction skit. There's nothing even that comes close. You know, when it comes to yeah, that's a top three, top five all time Saturday Night Live. Performance, Which is it's funny because when you go back and watch it, it doesn't. It's not the kind of thing that you can watch over and over and over again. the The fact that Gosling breaks as hard as he does really makes that sketch kind of a little bit better than it, than it actually is. Um, but it's, it's really good. It's yeah. a really funny. Experience. You so. are crazy. That is a joy. Every single time, the way she sets out the pieces and then chews them all up. is just, ah, yeah. It's a thing of beauty. No, I, anyway. I, I, that, I'm not saying it's not, it's, I, I agree. It's great. I don't know if it's the best of the two thousands because to, to me, I got to remember that Stefan happened in the two thousands yeah. and, I don't know if you've ever laid Stefan's back to back and watched them all. It's, no, they're good. I mean, you will yeah. mess with them. It's okay. they're they're that good. I hear you. Um, all right. Well, Ben Waddell, where can people find you online? 
Um, I'm online. I, I'm also a podcaster. I have That's two right. shows. One is called Geek Wars. The other one is called Die Hard on a Blank. Both of them can be found if you search the term geek wars, uh, cause they're both on the geek wars podcast network. That's right. So that's, that's the best way to find me. I also host a, a TV show here locally where I live, but you probably can't find that. <laughs> so, sure um, but, big Ben's movie show, right? It's a movie show. You can check that out online. You can find you the TV show is actually housed with the, the t- television station that has my show, but then I'm also on there and I do a lot of trailer reactions and uh, movie reviews and stuff like that. So, cool. You can check those out, too. All right, Ben, it's always a joy to talk to you, especially about uh, Saturday Night Live and where I get to tell you you're wrong, even when I don't actually think (laughs) you're wrong. But anyway, thanks, man. Thanks for coming on the show. We'll talk to you soon. All right. Thanks for having me. Bye-bye. This segment is brought to you by Jealousy. Feel like having a fight with your significant other, but your relationship is going great? Then you need Jealousy and... The S-Mart Department Stores of America. Shop smart. Shop S smart. That brings us to topic two. HBO's big play to get back into the prestige drama business. And you might say to yourself, Chris, they've been in the prestige drama business since they started it. What are you talking about getting back into it? Well, not a lot of HBO dramas have been doing all that great lately other than Game of Thrones. And with Game of Thrones ending in two seasons, they are hot off the stick to get another big water cooler type show going. And they're betting it all this week on Westworld, directed or written by Jonathan Nolan. And I believe his wife, Lisa Joy Nolan. Westworld is a update of Michael Crichton's 1970s theme park gone crazy uh, movie about robots in a western themed park that break down and start killing guests which might sound vaguely familiar to anyone who's seen Itchy and Scratchy Land or oh (laughs) dang it or Jurassic Park anyway so I'm so bummed because I had written down in my notes if this is happening in Westworld, I'd hate to see what's happening in Euro Westworld. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's funny. So, Sonia Mansfield. Yes. Uh, and, well, that's actually that's another thing. Let me let me run through let me run through this ridiculous cast. Yeah. Anthony Hopkins, Evan Rachel Wood, Ed Harris, James Marsden, Thandie Newton, Jeffrey Wright. And not to be mean to anybody else, but that's, you know. And then a bunch of other people. And then a bunch of other people. But, I mean, come on, Anthony. Any show that's got Anthony Hopkins in it, you got to pay attention to it. Sonia, what did you think of episode one of Westworld? I really like it. I say that, like, a little hesitantly. No, I really like it. It is very dark. Right. So... Part of me is like, I don't know. Do I really want to spend time on this show every week because it's so dark? But then it asks so many interesting questions that I feel like I have to keep coming back to it yeah. because I want to know what's going to happen next. I like what it's it's talking about. I mean, we're talking about like, you know, robots that are uh, they've received a like program upgrade and they get these things they call reveries, which are like memory, like recalls of past experiences and it's making them more human. Yeah. And, you know, they're not going to really like the way they've been treated. And yeah. I think it's really interesting. Cause then we're talking about like, this is a show that's going to talk about like life and death and humanity and inhumanity. And that's really interesting. That's a, big stuff so i'm interested so i'm gonna keep coming back but the show's really dark what did you think was the darkest part spoiler alert people we're gonna be talking a little we're not gonna well we're not gonna ruin this but we're gonna be talking about some stuff pretty much everything ed harris does oh that's right (laughs) is uh really dark and i'd be fine if i didn't see his character again to be honest and i like ed harris well let's see Um, if he's just so dark yeah. You know, and it's just, here we are. Here's another drama that's, like, filled with violence and torture and rape. Yeah. It's tough to stomach. Yeah. 
Yeah, that is. I was thinking about this. This is going to offend several people, but I wanted to throw this by you. I, I had this impression when Ed Harris was dragging Evan Rachel Wood into the barn for reasons that, well, why do you drag anyone any, anywhere? Right. Is it me or has the prevalence of rape in these HBO shows and on television in general grown at the same time that now they show full-on shots of people throwing up? Uh, I have not noticed that. It could just be me because I hate watching people throw up. And it seems like edgy shows like this. And, we're, you know, we, we're going to be talking about... Uh, well, what a coincidence. I hate watching people be raped. See, that's the thing. I, I'm talking... <laughs> I'm trying to talk about both of them, but I'm talking about it from the throw-up angle going into the rape angle when you're taking the much more sensible when I see, route. When I see going, someone throwing up, it makes me want to throw up. But when I see someone raping, it doesn't make me want to rape. That's <laughs> right. Because what I was going to say is there's a moment, and we're going to talk about Luke Cage next week, where some bad guys do something in Luke Cage, and one of them can't really handle it. So what does he do? Oh, he throws up. Oh, it's almost like to show your 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 big boy uh, drama cred <laughs> on an FX show or a uh, HBO show or an AMC show... Somebody's got to be raped, and somebody's got to throw I, up. I and do you feel watch like a both. lot of shows lean on sexual assault when they don't need to. Yeah. Uh, Game of Thrones, I actually think, adds it in. Like, sometimes it just doesn't need to be there. It's not important for the story. You know? If you, and they put it in there. Like, kind of even as background stuff. I think. You know? Yeah, I'm sorry. Keep going. And... The stuff in Westworld, I'm I'm a little bit more like, well, they're trying. This is part of why the robots are going to revolt, basically. Like, they are treated horribly. And this is what people do here. They pay all this money. They go to this, like, special land where they can do whatever they want to the robots. And one of the things that they do to these robots is have sex with them. And one of the things Ed Harris's character apparently likes to do is rape them. Right. It would be almost like dismissive to not mention it, I guess. Yeah. I don't know. Is that weird? Just like, it's almost like, it's almost like they have to show you how awful it is. So you'll understand. Yeah. And I think that's what I was going to say before, and it's interesting you should mention Game of Thrones, because I think this show and Game of Thrones, and this is going to sound really awful, use rape correctly in that the entire point of using it is to show an awful part of the human condition, and Game of Thrones is all about making your way in a world where every miserable thing is attacking you from all sides. So, you know, it's kind of like we've seen it enough on Game of Thrones. We don't need to see it much more. But having it in there as a, as, as a thing that happens mainly to the women on the show uh, while they're doing equally and awful things to the men in different ways, it, it just communicates this... Every level, every color of misery is going to be visited on the people of Game of Thrones. And in this one, it's what's interesting is the the human aspect, you know, like a lot of the Nolan Brothers entertainments. um, This has been described as kind of cold and chilly and very cerebral. But I think it's the humanity is coming from the robots. You're supposed to empathize with that's the robots. That's what I think is so interesting. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to yeah, interrupt no, you. Yeah, no, that's right. I love that we are meant to identify with the robots. Yeah. That's I, so, it, it's so different. Yeah. And I, which I really like, and that's something that they kind of played around with on uh, Battlestar Galactica, but I don't think it was ever, that aspect was ever super successful there. Um, but here, I just thought it was. I really liked it. And the, the attention, so so showing that horror, um, uh, 
I, I guess kind of meant something. It, it wasn't like a cheap, oh, we're going to show how gritty we are. Yeah, like it, meant, rape. it meant something. Yeah. For sure. But, but and I and I have a, but it's it's kind of like, all right, we got the message. We don't need to see it anymore, I don't think. Um, and I think, and I want to throw in a theory by you here. Because uh, in, in the first episode, you know, the robots are starting to act weird, but nothing too crazy is going on. Right. But there's a character that we're not sure if it, he's a human or if he's a robot, played by Ed Harris, tearing through this town and just visiting death and destruction on everything he touches. Do you think Ed Harris is there to intentionally provoke the robots, it's almost like he's like a, a real world hacker. He's trying to figure out what make the robots what makes the robots work, what their little ticks are, I, and he's gonna start messing with them almost I like to hack the that park. He was human. Right. And that he is some sort of almost like a Yeah, almost like a spy. Right. Or something. I, I mean, maybe he's like a human computer virus. I don't know. Right. Like, yeah. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. We don't, we'll we see. don't know that from the first episode. It's just you start right. to wonder. And I, I, I mean, he's treating the theme park like it's a video game. Right. Exactly. And he's, he's talking about like torturing and raping, and killing, and all this stuff that he's going to do. And he's trying to take it to the next level. Yeah. He says. So, which makes me wonder. At first, I was wondering. All right. So he's some sort of hacker. He's he's some sort of you know, interested computer hacker that's trying to figure out the the weaknesses in the system and then he's going to mess with them. But now I'm wondering, is he like the first robot that gained sentience and, he, and he's going around and trying to figure out the rules of this world so then he's going to actually, you know, do, you know, make himself like King Robot or something? Well, and um, that's one of the things that's cool about the show is there's a lot of people on this show where you're like, well, is that person a robot? Right. Right. You know, and they, they talk about like, they had like kind of a, an incident quote unquote that happened 30 years ago. And I'm like, well, was that incident what the movie was the oh, 1973 movie? I think I might've missed that, you know? And then, you know, then I wanted to know, can guests kill other guests? What does management want to do? Well, that's that yeah. is one thing that I wondered. Like, how do you know that you're not going to whoop out a six shooter and shoot a guest? Yeah. Like, as a person, they're they're so lifelike. How would you ever know? Yeah. And, and it is. I mean, I really like this. And you know, one thing that's interesting is that you know we've talked about in past episodes how HBO in recent years has had a problem with their uh, drama department is that they start up miniseries like Lewis and Clark and then they shut them down and don't go anywhere or they start up uh, this you know uh, Westworld was supposed to premiere last year right but I think they did a couple of episodes shut down production rewrote a bunch of scripts and then started back up and I believe it's one of the most expensive television shows ever made at this point yeah they spent like a hundred million dollars on the first season right which is that's actually what I think that's what they spent on the first the, the season of Band of Brothers, and I think it's like 150 million for the Pacifica Serpent. So they really spend a lot of money. But for the first episode, this is a very rich, very interesting world with a lot of different colors, a lot of different potential. You know, one of the one of the things I heard um, is that they shut down production. So uh, Jonathan Nolan and Lisa Joy Nolan could discuss what it meant to be human in this world and what humanity means so they could kind of get all these themes ready. And then they went back and started writing. You know, so this is this could be a textbook case of whenever you hear those stories about a troubled production and things getting messed up, it could be that's exactly what you want to have happen. You want production to stop. You want people to take a breath. You want to think things through, and then they can go back and fix things. Right. And make it that because the first this first episode I really liked. Yeah, we talked a lot about like rape and violence, but I I would also like to mention the show looks amazing. Yeah. The special effects are awesome. Yeah. It's beautifully shot. 
Yeah. The performances are really, really terrific. Like Evan Rachel Wood. Yeah. Is amazing. Yeah. Is the lead. Ed Harris, even though he's playing someone so awful, is always awesome. You know, and Anthony Hopkins. Yeah. It's it's so good. And James Marston, you know, everybody. Really yeah. good. They're all really Oh, and, Je- and Jeffrey Wright. I want to make sure I say Jeffrey Wright. Exactly. Jeffrey Wright, who's my favorite favorite Felix Leiter. But, um, and that it's the attention to detail that I think there something really special might be happening here. We'll see. Because I remember, at least for me, when I watched the first Sopranos, it was like, oh, this is interesting. I got it. And then let's see where it goes. And it just got better and better. But like the first uh, vinyl was just like, uh, all right. There's this. I guess I'll maybe keep watching it. But this, the first Game of Thrones was, I don't know where this is going exactly, but I like it. There's something about yeah. it that just grabs you in a good TV show. And for me, this show grabbed me. And I'm really interested to see where it goes. I also, what did you notice? I want to ask if something was just in my head or not. Okay. So, and then we'll. Yes. Then we'll move on. Yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> that's u- that's usually the correct answer. Um, so Anthony Hopkins at one point is trying to figure out why these robots are acting in a way that is not supposed to be in their programming. So he goes down and he pulls out, you know, these are like the 10th versions of the robots or they've been upgraded so many times. He goes down and he pulls out an old robot and just talks to it. Yeah. Did you notice anything about that? About that robot? Yeah. He looked like an old character from Deadwood. <laughs> he did. Well, yeah, that's true. <laughs> I'm like, did they get him from Deadwood? <laughs> Part of me is wondering if that's why they're bringing back Deadwood. It's it's kind of like, well, you know, we had to build the Western town and again, maybe so Deadwood screw it. Deadwood was part of uh, Westworld. <laughs> that's right. But the that robot, which was a much earlier version, actually kind of moved like a little bit like one of those animatronic. Yeah, Disney. yeah, absolutely. It like did. Like the 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 way the armed move and the way mm-hmm. he talked. And, it, and there was like the sounds too, where it was like. Eh, eh, Just yeah. yeah, but it was very subtle. Yeah. And, and if you weren't really looking at it, you could maybe not even see it. But it, like the way he, he like drank something, and the way he drank it, and the way he moved it up to his lips. And just the way his he would look up and look down and move his head. Uh, was it was it was creepy, but yeah. it was kind of cool. But anyway, so I really I was, liked uh, all the all the stuff with Evan Rachel Wood when yeah. they're talking to her, kind of in their like creepy office area, right? And right. she's kind of switching between like the character she's programmed to play, and then like just the computer that's inside, almost where they're like lose the accent, yeah, and you know, take the emotion out of your voice. And it's just like, she's just changing and changing and changing. It was really, yeah, really yeah. impressive. It's, it's good. So Westworld, good show, maybe a great show. I'm going to definitely be watching all 10 episodes this season. Sonia, what say you? I will be watching. I have way too many questions. Excellent. All right. So keep watching. Tell us what you think. Tweet at us. Let us know. This segment is brought to you by Indifference. Is your group of friends looking to decide where to eat? Do you want to drag it out until everybody throws up their hands in frustration? Then you need Indifference. So now that we've talked about one show for nigh on 18 minutes, let's talk about a bunch of shows real quick. Sony Mansfield. Yes. Status check on the fall TV shows that you're watching. What are you watching? What do you like? We had our big fall TV preview a couple weeks ago, but now we're into it. We've had a chance to watch some of the stuff we talked about. Tell me what you're watching. I have to say my fall TV picks, they're pretty good. I'm watching The Good Place, one of my picks. I really love it. Are you watching this one on NBC with uh, Kristen Bell and Ted Danson? Uh, Yes, and in another week or two, I suspect this will be the only show I'm watching that's on network television. I think it's really smart, and I think it's really funny. Like, I'm stoked 
<laughs> that I I picked wisely. You you pick great. This is a great. Yeah, this is this is the one by the makers of uh, Parks and Rec, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's fantastic. I I am loving it a lot. Um, I am also watching Speechless on ABC. Now, what is that one about? So this one is stars Minnie Driver as well. It's a family comedy, and one of the sons has cerebral palsy. And he cannot speak. So That's they hire right. like an aide. Mm -hmm. They like they've moved around from like school district to school district, finding just the right school. And they found a school that will provide like a permanent aid to their son, like and give him a voice. Right. And it's um, one of the men from Reno 911. And I can't remember his name is the voice of the son. And. Minnie Driver plays the mother and she's like this really aggressive like mother who will just do anything to help her son because he has all these special needs. And it's just really funny, though, like the way they handle it is so funny. And the, the kid who's playing the son with cerebral palsy is so good. It's a really funny show. Now, does the kid have cerebral palsy? He does. He does. But all he right. can actually he can actually speak. But he's playing a character who can't speak. OK. It's a really funny show. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. And as as a mother of a son who's autistic and has special needs, it clearly speaks to me. And what is your son's special needs? I know this if you don't want to say it. I already said it. I just said it. He's autistic. No. His that I'm his mother? His special needs is fans. Oh, and fans. He's a... <laughs> He loves yeah. to watch ceiling fans. If I could love anything, the way this kid loves ceiling fans, I we would. Oh my god, you. we would all be so much happier. Oh man, I, I would love to. I would love to live in his world. I have to admit, I'm <laughs> more often than not jealous of your son. <laughs> Every time you talk to me about him watching fans on an iPad or whatever, oh god, I would kill to love something like he, that. He he loves it. It's his. Breaking Bad. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine what kind of wonderful world this would be if watching a ceiling fan was as satisfying as Breaking Bad? I can't even <laughs> imagine that much joy. Well, All right. Anyway, them. sorry. Uh, I'm also, so I would say the last one I'm watching consistently of the new fall shows is Pitch. Mm-hmm. About uh, the female baseball player. Mm -hmm. I've only got to watch the pilot episode. I haven't got a chance to watch the second one yet, but I really liked the pilot. Thought it was very interesting, and I'm definitely going to watch more. Okay, cool. Uh, and then I did. St I watched one episode of Son of Zorn, and I was like, "That's enough of that." <laughs> <laughs> now why why was what was what was so bad now son of zorn is son about of zorn is the one that's like a mix of live action and animation and he's kind of like a he -Man. zorn is like a he-man character mm -hmm. who somehow impregnated cheryl hines and has oh, like i think we know how <laughs> i don't i don't know how those worlds mix but All right but i i have seen a uh, cool world so Maybe that's how. Oh, and God, uh, that's right. he, you know, he's like a he's not even a weekend dad. He's like, you know, someone who sees his son like every once in a while. But he like moves back to town to spend more time with his son. And uh, I just didn't think it was very funny. And I stopped watching. So let me get this straight. So they they're deciding to make a show. This this is this is probably going to be as this dorking out goes on. My number one rant. So they're going to conceive a show where a Hanna-Barbera type, poorly drawn, animated character, He-Man type character, runs around in our real world. Yes. And what they decide to do is, hey, let's make him a dad. And let's turn it into some domestic comedy where he's got domestic problems. And it's another, it's another family show where there's a mom and a dad and a kid and going to school and problems. Well, he's like, uh, he's like, the mom has like got a new fiance and stuff like that. So he's, it's not quite that, but, but, but yeah, it's that. But that, it's, yeah, it's, it's like, uh, let me, let me, let me guess. The mom's house is a nice house, two stories, white. I don't nice remember, lawn. but let's say yes. All right. 
there's, it's, there's, it's not very good. Yeah. You know what? Here's the thing. It's not good for a lot of reasons. One of the reasons diversity is going to be so great when it comes to television is because we're going to be able to watch characters that don't live in upscale suburbia, where they don't portray like every, you know, middle class home is two stories. It's white. It's got a big tree out front. It's got a swing in the back. It's just like. Oh, you need to watch Speechless. Okay, maybe I do. Because <laughs> they move into a house that's a total dump just because it's in the right school district. Okay, cool. See? So there's that. But there's just like, it's it's like uh, network executives have Tourette syndrome. It's like something early in television development, like somehow Leave it to Beaver's house got just grafted onto every network executive coming out of business school, and they just can't greenlight shows unless the neighborhoods look like Leave it to Beaver neighborhoods. And I love Leave it to Beaver, but we're 50 years on, 55 years on. Give it a rest. Other people live in other places. They do. That's right. See, that's the thing. That's my rant. I don't want diversity for harmony's sake. Yeah. I want diversity. Actually, you don't even want diversity of people. You just want diversity of locations. That's something. I mean, it's we got so well, many diversity I just, I problems. I just want people to stop throwing up on TV. <laughs> That's true. And I want them to live somewhere other than the suburbs. That's right. Yes. Is that too much to ask, network exactly. TV? See, that's the thing. And here's the thing. You're gonna, you're making fun of me, but what kind of house do they- I am making they, fun of you. Yeah. What kind of house do they live in in Blackish? I don't watch Blackish. The house I'm describing. It's almost <laughs> as though June Cleaver finally went to the home, left, and then the, the family from Blackish moved in. It's You wouldn't know it. And I love Blackish. It's a great show. But my God- Enough with the domestic two-story house, whatever. Anyway, sorry. I have... So, Smith, what shows are you watching? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm watching and the doing, background. And what are their homes like? <laughs> That's right. I'm watching the background <laughs> of a lot of homes. Well, domestic, or designated survivor, I thought I would give that a shot. I don't have a huge amount of time to watch television, but I figured, all right, you know what? De designated survivor, I haven't watched a lot of network television for a while. I'm not going to... I'm going to try this out and see what it is. It sounds like, because I've heard it's kind of like West Wing crossed with uh, 24, stars Kiefer Sutherland. So, of course, that's how they're going to promote it. He is a uh, House and Human Services secretary who uh, is away during the State of the Union. Congress is destroyed, so he becomes president. I made it through an episode and a half. Oh, it like the first what episode happened in the second episode that made you bail. It was just boring. Oh, it well, was that's just the, that is the biggest crime because because here's the thing. And it, it was just like you can see the plot twists coming from a mile away. It was like watching a television show. Actually, I'm going to save this line for the timeless review, but it was just so it was boring and it was very you could. There's some Paul or there's some imprint that major network shows have, CBS, ABC, Fox, and NBC, where you can see the network executives leaning over the writer's shoulders, watching them as they're putting the show together. And everything has this kind of ridiculous, annoying sameness where we've got to show that these people are real, relatable people. We've got to show that these people have a family and they love their families because they're good in the families. People love families, right? Right. All right. <laughs> so in the first episode, we're going to have, you know, uh, Kiefer Sutherland. He's going to be talking to their wife and they're going to be talking about how much they love their kids. And they're going to be calling their kids and go, who are going to a concert and they're worried, but they want to be cool, hip parents, but they also want to be involved. Uh, so we're going to do that. And Oh, my God, the Congress blew up. Uh, that's how 24 started. You now remember that? he's, yeah, now he's. That's exactly how 24 started. Exactly. It was something else blew up. Yeah, exactly. Now, oh my God, now he's the president, but he still has, uh, uh, he's still a dad. And he. And one of his daughters got caught in a cougar trap. That's right. And he, he leaves the situation room to go overhear his kids talk about 
how do you think dad's doing? Oh, dad's great. He'll make good decisions. <laughs> And he's great. And then you see, like, behind behind them, they don't notice. There's Kiefer Sutherland with his arms crossed. Oh, I love my kid so much. It's just so... <laughs> and then, see, that's the thing. And then the next scene, then the next scene, he goes back into the Situation Room and who blew up Congress and all that. But if you think about it... But who blew up Congress? Oh, exactly. Well, my kid. Here, Come on, you guys. The, yeah, here's the thing, is there... It, there are these moments that each individually kind of work within the scenes, but when they string them together, you can see the focus grouping or you can see the rewriting on it. It's like, oh no, now we need a moment where the where Kiefer Southern is relatable. Now we need a moment where he shows self doubt and he's wondering, and we feel for him. He's an underdog. Now we need a moment. So you can see you can see the machinery working, and there was one stretch where. He gets into an argument with a general in the Situation Room about how they're going to, you know, maybe bomb the Iranians who are trying some stuff. Then it's the scene with his kids. Then he's back into the Situation Room. (laughs) So what we're meant to believe is this president gets into it with a general. On his first day on the job, he tells the head of the Joint Chiefs, you better sit down, we're not bombing anything until I say bomb something. You better, you know, you better back down, general. Now if you'll excuse me. Now if you'll excuse me, I'm going to walk up 10 flights of stairs. I'm going to watch my kids for five minutes. And then I'm going to walk right back down here. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) It's like, in in the flow of the show, this president's just like wandering around. The White House. Anyway, yeah. So it's, uh, and then you have like cartoon FBI agents um, going, and I'm forgetting the, actually, you know what? I'm forgetting the name of the actress. But she's, you know, like head of the FBI, and Congress has exploded. She's at a bar. She comes down to where the FBI is starting to investigate. And I believe it was kind of like, oh, I thought today was your day off. Well, it is, but I thought if you could use some help. Yeah, no kidding. (laughs) Congress erupts in a geyser of flame. I think it's, you don't need to point out it was her day off. Exactly. (laughs) One is her day. And then she comes in and she says, I want you to check out every car uh, in a 10 block radius and see if they're stolen. And if, if they are, I want you to take a team down there and... Check them over piece by piece. And then another FBI agent goes, yeah, all right, I'm on it. Do you really need to explain to the FBI, hey, if you find a car that's within a block of the Capitol that's just exploded in maybe a mini nuclear explosion? uh, Also, yeah, if you find something like that, make sure you get a team and check it out. No kidding. Like, it's just... It's things like that. Like if you see someone walking around with one of those like bombs with the fuse sticking out, that's right. Like Wiley e. Coyote uses. It's stop like them. dumbed down storytelling that just drives me crazy. Um, so I was not a big fan of that. And then the second that's episode, bad. the second episode was just really on the nose political or not political commentary, but social commentary, which. In the hands of like a Vince Gilligan or, you know, the guys from Game of Thrones, it could have been the same story, but it would have just been told so much better and so much more cleverly. Um, And it was about a governor of Michigan who is starting to round up Muslims in Dearborn because it's a big Muslim population, which, okay, in in, in a climate of fear and after an attack like that and and a way to examine our recent fears it's it, it's that's an interesting topic and that might be something you want to uh examine but the way he does it is just like you're you know it's literally the president of the united states on the phone talking to this governor and the governor is like w- just walking from his car to wherever and you, you know you're not my president i'll do what i want i don't take orders from you and oh but we can't do this it's against the constitution well, the Constitution was just blown up in this, you know, in the Capitol. Don't you talk to me about the Constitution, Mr. Homeland uh, or House and Human Services President. That kind of thing. Just really yeah. ridiculous, cartoony, oh, yeah. dumb. And it's it's just, ah, it was just dumb. So I, I hit, I, I hit, it's like, I like where your heart is, guys. But the execution here 
is ridiculous. You can almost see, it's like, it's almost like, you know, watching Westworld or even watching like uh, uh, Fear of the Walking, or The Walking Dead or any of these other cable shows, watching network television is like watching marathon runners running with cement shoes. <laughs> it's like you could see they do it you could see it would be so good if you could just let them do their thing. But something about working at networks just doesn't let them do it. And it's just. Well, I think there's some awesome. plenty of shows on cable that aren't good, too. That's true. That is true. They just have a, I guess they have a better batting average. They, or maybe they just don't have to, fill, they don't try to fill up as much time. Right. Well, I yeah. think, yeah, I think that's a thing. And, and I, I figured out now that we're talking about this. I think I realize what it is I don't like about network television is the top of the the top of the list of network television, like the best shows on network television are kind of a middling range for cable. It's like there's like the best it used to be the best shows on TV were on network television unquestionably. Not even close, not even worth talking about. And now the best thing that's on network is like the fourth best thing on FX or something. Right. Um, or the 20th best thing on Netflix or HBO. Um, so which brings us to, I'm going to tee off on this and then we'll wrap this up. Timeless. Timeless. It's a show about a team of time travelers who are going through time to fight another team of time travelers um, going through who've stolen a, a modern time machine and they're going back. So the good guy time machine people s take the prototype of the time machine from an Elon Musk type corporation and they're going back and chasing them through time. This is the greatest television show of 1988. <laughs> It is so old in its the way that it deals with problems, the way that it has characters interact. It's 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 got all the problems I just described with Designated Survivor times ten. In the first now I want to watch it. In the first twenty minutes, we find out that the main character, her, her mother, is uh, built this um, history department at this. Uh, no name university, but she's not getting tenure. But she's the cool, um, she's the cool uh, history teacher that talks about uh, presidents taking out their penises in meetings and stuff. And it's one of the uh, uh, actually uh, what? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so she says this, and which which is kind of a it's a funny anecdote, but you can see the writers desperately trying to make her look like the cool history cool history professor right um then she goes home to find out and then we see that her mother is dying of some sort of disease cancer or something um and oh she loves her mother so much and what is she going to do with her life and is this crisis then homeland security shows up at her door exposition 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 she's in a time machine <laughs> going back in time Sure. To stop uh, the Hindenburg. Uh, or, well, yeah, to stop the Hindenburg from being saved, actually. Um, and it's Wait, just... so the evil people are taking the time machine and they're going back to stop the Hindenburg? Well, that's the first stop? Yeah, that's the thing. Is is It seems as though they're, they're trying to stop the Hindenburg, but what they're actually trying to do is destroy it just a little bit later when like Omar Bradley and, uh, you know, who led the D-Day invasion and Sikorsky, the guy that invented the helicopter and some other people are on the Hindenburg going back to Germany. How do they um, know where the uh, evil time travelers are going? Oh, they, you know, that's the thing. Is it, wow. Is, you can <laughs> I'm asking way too many questions. No, your that, dumb show. No, that's the thing is they, it's one of those shows where the, way that technology works is done in such a way as to get people into trouble, but it can't solve problems. So that you can tell when the time machine went to, but you can't tell the location. So you just kind of have to know where they're going. 
and so you can tell that you know the good guys could tell that the uh, time machine came back from the past, but they can't find it on Earth. And why does the technology work like that? Because then the show would be too easy. <laughs> Then people could make rational, reasonable de decisions, and this show would be over in two hours rather than theoretically seven seasons or whatever they're going to want to have. That so, they're probably not going to get from. Yeah, I think so. And that's the thing. And, you know, then, you know, the history professor is teamed with this rough and tumble uh, Delta Force guy who, when he goes back in time, he tells. He saves this woman he's not supposed to save, and she gets mad, and she goes, why'd you save her? We're supposed to let these people die so we don't mess up the time stream. Oh, well, she looked like my wife, my dead wife. Mm -hmm. It's that kind of show. And then yeah. he kind of looks off, and he's and we're supposed to feel sorry for him, but he just looks like the worst emo. <laughs> Here's the thing. <laughs> this is the other thing that drives me crazy about this, is people on network shows... They're always 10 years too young for whatever job they have. <laughs> and they're all – because this, this history professor looks like she's like 25, but right. she's she's up for tenure and all this stuff. Yeah, of course, because she started teaching when she was like 14. Pretty so. much. Or they're just they're, – they're, they all look like either – they look they all look like some sort of model. Oh, and, sure. And this guy looks like an underwear model. And you can tell – well, and one of the problems with this is and is they're just not – when you pick people for roles by how they look rather than how they can act, you know, there's a lot of bad acting that's coming through there. And he was just awful, you know. So anyway, I finished the episode. I'm not going back. It's like – kind of an interesting thing and it, like a show about time travelers could be cool, but it just, that we, what, what we need to but do. But not Sunday, this one. Not this one. We need to figure out a word. I don't want to call it network itis or something, but there's just some bad mojo that networks put on shows that just make them unwatchable. So yeah, it was really quite awful. So I'm I'm sure it's about all their notes they get. I'm sure it the is. Sort of notitis. Exactly. So it's not it's not an accident that most shows that come on HBO, most shows that come on FX, AMC are at least watchable. They they might not be something that's your cup of tea, but you can see they're really trying something, they're really going for it, and they might not succeed, but it's interesting. Or it's, it's a good shot. But like Timeless, I swear to God, it's like if this is, you know, Stephen Cannell's, this 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 would be like the show he makes after the A-Team went off the air. <laughs> That's what the show is. Well, I think on sh things like HBO and FX, they hire good people and then they trust those people to make a good show. Yeah. People yeah. with a vision and a plan. Yes. Yeah. Agreed. And I think on network, they tend to maybe hire, they just, they're like, we like this idea. Exactly. Yeah. And then they, and then they put like everything else in place or something. Yeah. It's just, you know, and there, that's the thing. And I think a show like The Good Place has a clear vision. Yeah. And an idea here and good people behind it. And that's why it, it does so well and timeless. I don't know anything about it. Yeah. It's, it's really quite boring anyway with all of that being said which is a lot on to our favorite headlines and that brings us to our final segment our favorite headlines of the week uh, Smith, do you want to go first or shall I go first? Why don't you go first? I've okay. been talking a lot. Okay. So my favorite headline of the week is the Scarface remake is happening, which means every guy I dated in college has to get a new Scarface poster <laughs> for his room. <laughs> what will this mean for the world of rap? <laughs> 
I don't know. Uh, well, it's been remade. It's what's funny is uh, I assume that this is going to ruin people's childhoods. Let, let, There'll be let, a new. Let's scar- do it. We got to ruin one childhood every episode. <laughs> it's been a remake. Bef- that the thing is, though, is people don't know it's been remade. Like the 1983 one with Al Pacino is technically a remake of the 1932 one. So it's already a remake, but they don't remember that. That's right. Um, but it's got uh, Terrence Winter is writing it. Ooh. And Terrence Winter, of course, was someone who worked on The Sopranos and Boardwalk Empire. I believe he also wrote The Wolf of Wall Street. He did. I just so, got very excited for this so remake. So that makes it way more interesting than just some rando remake. Mm. So that was my pick of the week. Does it say who's going to who's going to be in it or No, who's they don't attached? have any of that None of that yet. They don't have a director or anything? I think it was the same guy who did Magnificent Seven. (gasps) That's right. Oh, snap. That could be interesting. But they're working on the script again, I guess. He's taking a pass at it. That's Anton Fuqua, right? That's right. Thank you. Yes. And I I, I feel bad because I'm pretty sure I'm saying that wrong somehow, even though I really like him as a director. But... Anyway. Well, I think Anton Fuqua, or however you pronounce his name, he doesn't need to always be doing all these remakes. Uh, I well, like, you know Seven, what? The Equalizer was a remake too. Yeah, that was him. I liked I liked the Equalizer, and actually, they're supposed to be saying, making another it, one. Aren't and they? now he's doing Scarface. Yeah. That's a remake. You know what? Yeah, if he can keep going for as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> What's your pick of the week? Well, given all of my talk about originality and leaving out business notes and everything from the creative process i'm just going to come clean and say that the new pirates of the caribbean (laughs) movie put out its first teaser with javier bardem as the bad guy and i'm excited despite the amnesia inducing boringness of the fourth pirates of the caribbean movie amnesia inducing because i genuinely cannot remember what the hell that's about. I believe I saw the first two. Right. And I'm one of those people that likes the first three. They're kind of a trilogy. Um, Most people don't like the second two. It's kind of like the Matrix that way. And everybody loves the first one, but the second two, they drive them crazy. My advice, kind of like with uh, Casino Royale and Quantum of Solace, is if you watch them together... They're much better. Hmm. Doesn't matter, though, because I think Pirates of the Caribbean has kind of acquired the reputation a lot of people feared it would have when they first announced the first movie, which is, what, this is a movie about a theme park ride? How good can it be? And then we were all surprised. The first one's very good. Exactly. That's the thing. The first one's very good. The fourth one is like, oh, this is kind of what we were expecting the whole time. Yeah. So the... New teaser comes out, uh, and we'll have a link in the show notes so you can check it out for yourself. Um, It looks like it's back to some sort of ghost pirates or whatever. Uh, I believe the plot is some Javier Bardem, some ghost pirate, is coming to hunt pirates. And the first one he's looking for is Jack Sparrow. So I'm sure a lot of hilarity ensues. Um, (laughs) But it's... Watch watch it, because there's a, a little glimmer of humor in there. There's a moment in there that I thought was really funny. It could just be me and my weird sense of humor, where they're being very sinister, very creepy, and then it kind of goes in this other direction that I think could be a harbinger of kind of a return to form for this. Or it could just be, I want to like these movies, even though they're the definition of corporate... <laughs> cinematic filmmaking, synthetic filmmaking. Just ignore all of Smith's rant from our That's right. Topic three. Yeah, that's right. I don't care. I am excited for Pirates of the Caribbean. I don't care what Pirates that does. Pirates of the Caribbean or the network television of the movie theater. That's but you're right. fine with it. That's right. That's right. Fine. I was I was gonna make some sort of I wonder what it's I wonder if the way that I like Pirates of the Caribbean is kind of like how people like the Transformers movies. 
<laughs> I have not seen any of the Transformer movies, oh, so I can't. Really? Yeah, I'm so lucky, right? You are lucky. See, here's what's so awful lucky. for me, and at some point we should talk about this, is I watched the first Transformers movie with – I, I, I like to go to the movie with my boys. We kind of do that rather than go uh, – to, you know, rather than watch sports, we go watch movies. Anyway, first one I watched is like, okay, there's that. It's, you know, it's like a Spielberg and a Michael Bay movie smashed together. So I was like, all right, I got it. The second one was one of the worst film-going experiences I've ever had. The third one was just as bad if it was, it was awful. I can't even believe that you went back and saw another one. Exactly. Which makes it even more shocking that I went to see the fourth one. Jesus. What's wrong with you? I don't know what's wrong with me. I don't know why I do it. You're part of the problem, Smith. Yes, I, I will admit. I, I have a lot of explaining to do. When the show trials of uh, moviegoers occur after Hollywood collapses... And they don't make any good movies anymore after the comic book uh, bubble bursts and the show trials begin of who brought us to this awful, awful movieless place. Yep. I, I will be right up there for having seen all of the Transformers movies. This is so the thing far. that's going to come back to haunt you in the afterlife, like in the movie Defending Your Life. <sighs> that's right. And they're, and they're playing all the scenes of your life that's right. when you're on trial. That's what's going to come out. <sighs> Start preparing your defense now. I can't because he's so awful. Michael Bay is – I don't like anything he does, but I've seen, I believe, every single one of his movies. <laughs> I've seen Pain and Gain. I give you shame. Uh, yeah, all right. Well, I don't think I have And on that shameful say. note. <laughs> Are you going to say goodbye? Yeah, I'll say goodbye. Bye! The Dorking Out Show is on Twitter at Dorking Out Show, where you can find Chris at Jet Jurgens and Sonia at The Sonia Show. You can read about Sonia's random adventures at thesoniashow.com and track the slow and creeping progress of Chris's novel and his other hijinks at jetjurgens.com. You can find out more about the Dorking Out Show at dorkingoutshow.com. While you're over there, you can support us by giving us a review on iTunes. We have a handy-dandy iTunes link to whisk you right back to 2007 where you can leave your review and five-star rating in iTunes. We'd do it for your podcast. Want to dork out even more? Well, you can sign up for our newsletter, where you'll get all the headlines we use as fuel for the show. That's it for this week. Thanks for listening.